Dean Scott, members of the platform, members of the faculty, friends, family, associates of the graduates, and particularly to the graduates who brought us all here today. I'm honored to be here, and I must say, in some respects, quite surprised. See, back in 1967, yeah, 1967, I applied for admission to the Western Law School. <laughs> um, they told me they were not accepting C averages. <laughs> so I went back and had makeup here. And they told me they were not accepting high C averages. <laughs> And I must say, and this is absolutely the truth, the registrar at the time told me that perhaps I should put my energies in another area. So to get a job, I interviewed the accounting firms. I interviewed the accounting firms in London because I was going to stay in London. And I took the one that paid the most money, and I took that job because I was going to go from there over to Europe. But I found out I liked the accounting. And so I stayed and I actually used that to a friend of mine to get a job and he asked me to go to Toronto with the Toronto Blue Jays. And so the message to this thing is you never know where your opportunities are going to come from, but if that register accepted in Western, I probably would never have got to where I am right now with the Blue Jays. So thank you for the rejection. <laughs> or the moral of the story is, as uh, George Bush said when he was speaking at Yale, it's unlimited what you can achieve with a good C average. Now we got to be president of the United States. Um, to each of you, I say congratulations. Uh, I know a little bit about the law school because I had in 1960, in 19, uh, 2007 rather, uh, the honor of um, being here as our son at the time and daughter in law to be graduated from the Western Law School. My brother in law, in fact, graduated from law school in 1973 with the gold medal. So I know the hard work that you all put into this. And I know that the commitment that you made for the last three years will pay off. But let me say this, because I know you're going to look back and say this was great years and the best years of your time. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This next little while is going to be spectacular for you as you get your feet on the ground and see what the challenges are going to be and the thrills that you're going to enjoy. Well, will take that road, but let me give you an example. My son left him for six years, worked for Scadden Arms in Toronto. He did very, very well, liked it, but I was one of him in sports. Now he is with the dreaded, vile, hated Boston Red Sox. <laughs> Just had a son, son's born American. I don't know if he knows it, you, he knows the spark stars Michael Banner, but the fact of the matter is, he is now in Boston. He, he parlayed his job, or his uh, education and his job to get him to where he wanted to be. My brother, on the other hand, uh, is on the Court of Appeal. And uh, when I look at what he's done, and his name is Justice Doherty, you may have read some of his decisions because he is a person that is actually um, kind of mean. <laughs> uh, in fact, there are a number of lawyers that want to be my position because I say that that's the dumbest decision I've ever read. <laughs> and no, he has to kind of accept that. But I can tell you that I'm coming, I, I can tell you, coming out of the Western Law School, I mean, both of them parlayed into what they wanted to do, and they enjoy what they do, and they have that passion for what they're doing. Dave Doherty, the law. I mean, he studies the law, he loves the law, he works the law, he practices the law, and his idea of, you know, reading some good decisions from around the world so that it can impact his, impact his thinking is something he enjoys. My, other, my son, on the other hand, is more interested in basically what's happening with the Red Sox, but he enjoys that too, and uses that thinking and uses the law to take it to a different direction, so you never know where your opportunities are. The dean asked me today to ask to, to, to really address a couple of my experiences that might be instructive to you, the graduates, today. My first thought is you never have enough pitching, but I don't think that's what you meant. <laughs> so, for me, when I reflect on my career, and I admit mean, I didn't know what I was going to say when I started to put my thoughts together today, I thought I would give you some advice that I might give to my children. I might give to my friends, I might give to my neighbors, I might give to that poor unsuspecting soul that I was unfortunate enough to sit beside an airplane at some point in time when I was wound up. But I've got four things I want to tell you. The first one is, you have to be prepared to take a chance when the opportunity meets you. I mean, that will come to each and every one of you. I came here and I loved the county. I mean, I, I didn't think I was going to. I really took it as a job. But when I, when I got into it, I found that I really liked the, the, liked the discipline. 
But I had an opportunity to do something that not very many people do, which is get into professional sports. I didn't really apply for the job. I happened to be the president of the Bats and bring the team to Toronto. I went and I did that. And for me, it was a clear decision that I will never ever regret. I wouldn't have been able to do it without my help at the time. But I took a chance. Because we had a young daughter at the time. We were moving to Toronto. I'm not making this up. We probably had two or three thousand dollars in our pocket. You know, and I was on some type of a scale because I really fooled the people up at South Freshwater or Coopers into thinking that I could be a good partner. But you know, the fact of the matter is I was in a position at that point in time where you know I had to make a decision. I did. And you know, it was one I do not regret. You know, I got past Highbury Avenue, as they say, you know, and I moved out. But then after that, you know, after 1997, we had a really good run for about 20 years. I had an opportunity to go to New York. Well, I said, I don't know about New York. I said, let's just give it a shot. So I went to New York for five years as president of Major League Baseball. I gave up the head of the Blue Jays at that point in time, but I took the, I took the, the knowledge that I had and when we got to New York, it was a spectacular five years. The fact that we live in Manhattan, the fact that we live in downtown, the fact that we were working in Midtown, all worked for it too. But it was taking that chance. You didn't know where that chance was because unlike my father who taught for 40 years and I took the same classroom, the same school, lived in the same house, we were growing up in Welland. So the reality of the situation is, you know, we have the chance to move now because the world is a lot smaller and you know people. And so from my point of view, it was chance. So then when I left there, I came back and I retired. I want to pick up on something Dean said. When I retired, I started to say, I've had such a good life and I've had so much fun and I've been retired basically where I could say to myself, every day was a Saturday since 1976. And I wish that for every one of you, that you could be able to say that. You want to go to work and you can have some fun, but at the same point in time, you enjoy it. When I came back, I decided to get back and got involved with what is now the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Became the chairman, got involved in mental health, and it was something that I not only found to be rewarded, but I found that it was instructive to me for the people I met, the things that we're doing. You never know where those opportunities are going to come from. And the people that I met there were some that had become my lifelong friends, and it was terrific doing. I sat a couple more reports, and then I got asked to go back to Toronto, to go back to the Blue Jays. I went back to the Blue Jays in 2008. I was almost summarily dismissed in this past time, this past winter. However, having said that, Things happen. You adapt, you move on. But the reality of the, situ the, reality of the situation is that you, know, you take a chance. And you are going to have those opportunities. And you're going to take those chances. And I would just suggest to you right now, with the ability to get around, the ability to stay in contact with people, it is not a journey like going across the ocean not seeing your friends. So consider that when you have that opportunity. Second thing is, is you have to listen to the voice of experience. There's a quote, I don't know if I call her what, what, what I'm pronouncing right from Mirma Boss, Boss Savin. She said, to acquire knowledge, one must study. To acquire wisdom, one must observe. To acquire knowledge, one must study. To acquire wisdom, one must observe. And there's some truth in that. One of the great speakers that you want to listen to if you have an opportunity sometimes is Pinball Clemens. And you know, and pinball can come all over the place. You never know where it's going to come from. He's always got some type of phrases. He said, the Lord gave us one mouth, but he gave us two eyes and two ears. You know, and he kind of does that whole thing with him. I go, one mouth, two eyes, two ears. There was a purpose for that. You know what? And there's some truth in that. Because I think you have to look and see what's around you, and there you learn from it. There's a mentorship program that you can always have, but you know, you're only lucky to get one good mentor in life. I had one of the guy named Peter Hardy. He was a grade 12 graduate, and that was extent of it. Never went to university, rose up to become the president, the chairman of, of John and Matt Limited. He then went on to Nebraska, and he was maybe 40 years different than me. But the reality of the situation, he taught me more, listened to him, and watched me. I always had time. I always had time to sit and tell me what I should be doing and what I shouldn't do, where I made mistakes. And as long as I was honest with him, he always had my back. I always had my back. I didn't have to worry about it. And he always had the lines. You know, he always said, pump up your guts and do this. You know, and tell people you're going to fire them, fire them with their face. You don't do it by email. You don't, well, it wasn't around that back then. You don't do it on the phone. You don't do any, any of those things. You do it to your face. Treat the people with class and dignity. Small guy. He knew that if you know, you fool, you know, if, if you fool him, he could actually, you know, in five foot six, you know, he got his hands around your neck, you might have a bit of a problem. You know, the reality of the situation, he taught me. I watched him. I saw how he did things. I saw how he treated people. I saw, more importantly, the way that, you know, he made his decision based on common sense. 
and he that's heard. Then I'll just be quoting about the old days growing up in Toronto or who we saw here in some court report. And the fact of the matter is, he was an observer. Bobby Maddock, who was probably as good a baseball mind that ever lived. I'm not talking about just the baseball mind in the last 25 or 30 or 40 years. As a player, as a scout, as a development guy, you know, I would sit in the clubhouse and listen to these guys talk about the game and look about the fundamentals of the game. I watch, and then you know, when you get into it, you get a little more confidence, and you know, you move from there. Matic always used to say, "Well, even this one, because you're going to have a little debate about it later on, which comes first, confidence or success." You'll worry about that at some point in time. But the fact of the matter is, there is always this debate. There's always this discussion. You watch people do things, and it's very, very, very instructive as to what you're doing. The third thing is, you can't be afraid to make a mistake. Abraham Lincoln said, "You can tell I've done some research." My greatest concern is not whether you'll fail, but whether you're content with your failure. I started looking at some other ways of looking at this thing, and I started you know, looking at what we've gone through with the Blue Jays the last six years, because I think it's more relevant and more back into the, what we call the old days. But you know, I remember when we hired Alex Othopoulos, you know, we had to make a decision, and I remember pointing to Nir Muhammad, who at that time was the President Rogers, and I said to look at got this guy, I think that we're going to make the general manager. He said, who is he? Alex Sotopoulos. I said, you're going to have trouble spelling it, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> fact of the matter is, Alex was a terrific guy who was 32 years old. And, you know, the reality was that they didn't think the guy 32 years old could do it. And I said, use the whole thing. Like, we can't make a mistake unless we take a chance. You know, we just sit back and we remove and, we, and, 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 and we recycle the types of people that have been there before. It's not going to work. I want to tell you, this guy has not only intelligence, but he also has smarts. And, you know, not the two are always the same. But Alex has put together, you know, what I believe to be a real good foundation for this organization for the next 10 years. And it was, you know, taking that chance. You know, we had gone the other way, but, you know, not being afraid of failure. And to me, that was the critical part. But Alex is learning. This is why he's a smart guy. This is why he's a smart guy. You learn about you know the trade when the name was built up, when they moved out Miami, when we gave up a whole group of young players that we had signed and brought and brought in Reyes and Burley and, and, and the group of players. We learned about Donaldson this year, because he went a little bit further. We learned about a character guy. We learned about a guy that can play the game, a guy who's a baseball player, not necessarily an athlete, but a baseball player. And he learned from what he because he wasn't satisfied with that last trade. You know, and he didn't sign him. Big multi-year contract for that at Russell Park, although $83 million for five years, they bad money to get. But you know, he went up and got Russell Park, and he brought him in, and he learned from the old trades, you know, of the or the old signings of the of the of the $150 million so, um, and the eight years and the commitments that you make. You know, so it's a five-year $83 million deal. But you learn from it. he wasn't satisfied. And to me, that is that is absolutely key as, as you go forward is you can't be afraid to make a mistake. In our game, you'll make a lot of mistakes. But in life, you'll make a lot of mistakes. But it's how you react to it and how you learn from it. Because at first day, mistakes will reveal a lot. That's why I teach you a lot. But it will reveal a lot of a lot of people and how they react to them. My last piece of advice, and this is a, this is a key one, is really you have to worry about each one. You have to worry about what your personal brand is going to be. What your personal brand is going to be. Because you all have a brand. You're all going to help one. Everyone's going to say something about you because everyone develops a little bit differently. And I suggest as you grow older, if you have the wisdom, you have the experience, you know, you at least consider the following three things. And I really do believe this. One of them's out of the Bible. And you know, whether you're whether you're a Christian or not a Christian it makes no difference. Matthew 7, do the, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, it's just common sense when you think about it. But you're going to see this, you're going to live it, you're going to feel it, you're going to be able to do and, and, and explore it. You've got to treat people with respect. You've got to treat people with honesty. You've got to do what is right the way that you would want to be treated. You want to get you have people available to you, you've got to make yourself available to them. You've got to work hard. If you're expecting to work with somebody else, you've got to work hard. You've got to show that there are no surprises out there, that you've done the right things. And then you can build a culture of trust. Then you will stand for something. That's the easiest thing to do. I think if you know if you look at it, you say to yourself, you know, this is the best, you know, because I want to be treated fairly, so I'm going to treat somebody else fairly. That's something that you want to think about. Then we go to Hamlet, and you know, go to Polonius speaking to Larius. To thine own self be true. Number two. Is that the Bible? Well, you got Shakespeare. Not bad so far. <laughs> 
Because you have to know your strengths and you have to know your weaknesses. You have to know your limitations. You have to know what you can't do. Surround yourself with people that can do things. And if you can do that type of thing, you put yourself in a position, in my opinion, that will let you have the foundation that you need forward so that you can complement those weaknesses and build a, a, build a future. It's very important because we're all not blessed with everything we can do. There's no such thing as a natural, and there's no such thing as somebody who knows everything. And then the best one. So we got the Bible, right? We got Shakespeare. Bruce Springsteen sang. It's all right, there was a time. <laughs> and don't ever forget about it. I have seen a good company, a good offer, a good organization that doesn't have a good time. That doesn't have the ability to laugh and laugh at itself, to make mistakes, to want to go to work. You'll read about this work life balance. You know, like, you know, you know, have a date with your wife, you know, spend some time here. The real key to it, as it was written in the Globe, and I can't remember, it was just an article where somebody had said, you know, the real work-life balance means one to get up in the morning and go to work, and one to leave work at night and go home. Think about that. I mean, it's not like, you know, we're going to carve off time. You know, you're going to get up in the morning, you're going to have that energy, you're going to take it to work, and you're going to do the thing that you want. But at the same time, at the same time, when that works over, you want to be home. And that, to me, is what real life balance is all about. So those are the, those are the, the, the three things that, that, that I think are part of anyone's brand. And if you can, if you can, if you can enjoy that, you can do that, I think uh, you're going to put yourselves in a position where your future not only is bright, but more importantly than that, your future is going to be exciting. Because the world right now, with all the problems that it's got, the problems that I've always been there, is still a very exciting place. The ability to travel, the ability to connect, the ability to do things, gives you a chance that very few of us in the past have had. And I'm going to tell you, 25 years from now, right now this will look like the Dark Ages. I don't know how it's going to change, but it will look like the Dark Ages, and you are going to be neighbors of that, and you are going to be right at the front line. So I'm going to leave you with this, a couple of quotes, and I just want to say, in all sincerity, how much I do appreciate being here. I wish my father was alive, but I can say, Dad, I was lost to graduation and practice. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I addressed those lawyers. But he's not. Uh, but anyway, there are two quotes I want to do, and I want to pick up on something that the Dean said, because I think it's probably the most important thing. And if the Dean had done a little bit more research, he would have come up with this. <laughs> um, a life is not important except on the impact that has on other people's lives. That was Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson was probably at the forefront of the civil rights movement when he started in Montreal, signed the Brooklyn Dodge, and played in Montreal. But life is not important except for the impact it has on other people's lives. And he lived that, and he preached that. That's a very, very famous line. But the giving back that the dean has suggested that is now an obligation, a duty, a responsibility, but a reward, will be something that you'll all look up. So as you go forward and you live here today, while well, your education formally may be completed for a lot of you, it's really just starting. Your ability as leaders, because you are the future leaders, will be something that, in all honesty, you are going to have to think about giving back. And so the impact that you can have on lives, I think, is terrific. And I compliment the Dean for even suggesting that, that you know, this is the, the responsibility. And with that, there was one other famous guy that, um, that was a baseball guy, and his name is Gilby Mera, um, who said, it's uh, not over until it's over. Ladies and gentlemen, it's over. Thank you very much. <laughs>